Good evening, everyone. Now that we filled our Jewish duty to start everything 15 minutes late, we can get started. <laughs> I want to welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us this evening for this uh, historic lecture here in Weston. And for the moment, I just want to give you a little uh, the genesis of uh, genesis, <laughs> <laughs> the genesis of this uh, event. And uh, there's one person that really uh, deserves credit for putting this all together and making this happen. That is my good friend, Ben Lapp. <laughs> ben approached me about uh, two years ago, <laughs> a, year and a, half. <laughs> a year and a half ago, and brought up the issue. And uh, at the time, I was a little busy. I pushed him off. And he persisted, and I'm happy he did. And he put this together, made sure that uh, every detail was uh, taken care of. But the lesson I learned from Ben is if you want to get something done in this shul, Ben Lapcher is the guy. And, uh, but it's a lesson for all of us. If you want to get a program done, you can make it happen. Um, I want to thank his wife, Evelyn, for helping us tonight as well, the front desk. The uh, lecture of tonight, the speaker is going to be introduced by my good friend Ben. But on the subject itself, I just want to uh, say that for many, this, uh, the subject of science versus Torah, or science and Torah, the seeming conflict that some see it as, has been a, a big obstacle, one can say, in their commitment and their uh, being able to embrace the Torah way of thought, the Torah way of life, certainly. And it has been a, a subject on the minds of many for many, many years. And they always see the Torah as a little bit uh, old, archaic, old ideas, whatever. It's something that the modern science can never merge, and so on and so forth. And there have been many the last 50 or 60 or 70 years or more that have tried to explain the Torah and explain, tried to explain science so that they do match. And Dr. Schroeder is one of those people uh, that have written books on the subject. But I'm not going to steal the thunder from you, Ben. But I just want to say about this topic that I'm honored to be able to host this evening to have organized this evening to shed some light on the most important topic. I look forward myself to sit right there and listen in, Dr. Schroeder, to hear your wisdom. And without any further ado, I give the mic to Ben Lapter to introduce to you to tonight's speaker. <laughs> Sorry, one thing. Um, after the lecture is over, uh, we're going to, as you see over here, we're going to sell uh, Dr. Schroeder's book. He's going to sign it. If you want to have an autograph from him in the book, we have book signing right after the event, after the questions and answers session. And they're $25 a book. And we have a limited amount. We have only 35 books. And more than 35 people in the room. So first come, first serve. Thank you, Rabbi. And thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, like Rabbi said, this is a topic that generated a lot of interest in many people, including me. And you typically find uh, the version of the scientists and the version of the scholars or the rabbis or whoever learns Torah. But very seldom you find someone that has dedicated all his life to studying both points of view. So this is what intrigued me and that's what I thought it would be interesting to share with all of you. So to give you a little bit of background about uh, Dr. Schroeder, he, he just arrived yesterday from Jerusalem where he lives with his uh, extended family of 20 plus people. It's a big family. Dr. Schroeder is a scientist, researcher, professor, and author. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in earth and sciences and physics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, 
where he taught for several years at the physics department. Later moved to Israel where he joined the Weizmann, the Weizmann Institute of Science and then the Volcani Research Institute, while also having a laboratory at the Hebrew University. In his work with nuclear disarmament, he invented and patented the first real-time monitor for airborne alpha, beta, gamma emitters. I'm sure everybody knows what we're talking about. <laughs> I have no clue. Sounds, sounds very interesting. He has over 60 publications in the world's leading scientist journals, uh, reporting Time, Newsweek, Scientific American, leading newspapers around the world. For the past 25 years, Dr. Schroeder is 28. I just found out he's 28. Dr. Schroeder has also pursued the study of an ancient biblical interpretation and its correlation with modern science. He, said he has lectured in multiple synagogues, NASA, the NSA, and mega churches around the world. He has written six books, two of them are right here, translated into 11 languages, including Genesis and the Big Bang and the Science of God. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Gerald Schroeder. Sees me 
reading a text in Hebrew. It was called the Bible. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading the Bible, and he looks over, he starts talking, he's a devout Catholic, and he speaks enough, he, I don't speak Italian at all. That's one of the pleasures of being there, no one speaks English here. So, so, so I won't tell you the name of the town, because we want to keep it secret. But, it's, but, but he says to me, it's interesting, because his, his Padre, I don't call the name, like his priest, said that they're not allowed to read the Bible because you'll misunderstand it, so you have to listen instead to the priest. I mean, it could be more opposite than the Jewish approach to the world, where everyone's supposed to read it, and you're arguing forever, as I'm sure the rabbi gets this constantly. So, uh, it's a, it just, and so Galileo is just an interesting example of how he was, he was locked away because it would confuse the average person. Well, we don't hope about that, thank God. So the text this evening is to try to see from our physical world, whether there's a metaphysical aspect as well, whether beyond the physical there's the metaphysical. We now know absolutely, with no question, that, the, that by metaphysical I mean outside or beyond the physical world we experience, the space, the energy, the stuff of the world, that there are forces in this world that are completely, that we know they interact, but, but they do not find their origin in the physical world. Unlike the force of a magnet, which when you put two poles together, you know, they try to push apart. You can put your hand, you can't feel anything, but you can see the origin of those forces, the, the electrons that are, that are at, the, at the two positive, at the two negative poles, they want that if they're pushing apart, or positive or negative, pulling together. <coughs> that we can see. But there are forces in this world that if they weren't there, your iPhone, well, you wouldn't have to ask the people to turn off their iPhones because there would be no iPhones, okay? The, there are phenomena that take place, one of them is called tunneling, which is completely illogical. It only happens because of the fact that every, every aspect of the world has a particle aspect that is discrete like a ping pong ball, but also an extended wave. It's the famous wave-particle duality. So duality is, 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 is in the essence of our world. So when you come to the idea of a mind-brain duality, it fits directly. I'm not going to get into that this evening. But it's just interesting that this that duality that Descartes talked about 300 years ago, and people say, oh, Descartes is dead, you know, he's the philosophy is dead. It's the exact opposite. The idea of a mind being separate from the brain, it's not the season type at all. Uh, and I don't know why I got off on that tangent. But without that being, the, that is the only, that finds its origin essentially in the same physics that allows your iPhone to work and also the physics that allows the sun to shine. If there were not this phenomena in quantum physics, which is used every day in every transistor that exists in the world, and it's called transistors that are being worked, of something called, it's a phenomenon called tunneling, which makes no sense whatsoever. But, you know, when you turn the phone on, it works. I and mean, when you look at the sun, it's shining. No, no, no metaphysical forces, no sunshine, and no iPhones. But, of course, if you had no sunshine, you would have to work with the iPhone. That would be the least of the problems. Anyway, so physics has come to demonstrate that there are metaphysical forces, forces that are beyond the physical world that we experience, that interact with us. Sometimes it sounds very much like God. You know, this metaphysical whatever <coughs> that is not at all physical but does have a great influence on making the world be the world it is. Okay, let's... So, the, the range of topics is extreme, okay? And it's no, obviously we can't in the three hours that we have dedicated for this evening. Not going to Everyone's always so much fun. The ladies here. But, just briefly, the origin of life. If anyone tells you, and I speak this as a, to, I don't work in the, in, very deeply in the biological sciences, a little bit, but not, not, not deeply enough, but I'm quoting the masters in the field, if anyone tells you that they understand how life started, they are either naive or liars. No one has a clue as to the origin of sight. There's the idea of an RNA world, like the RNA is about zero because it's so unstable, that's why you don't find any RNA in ancient bones, you can find DNA, which is very stable. But how you get to, you know, the genetic codes, in other words, aspects. There's not a, what sustains life, the universe is made for sustaining life. The laws of nature are perfect. 
for sustaining life. It, it's, it's clear after a while that it's like a design. In fact, the major scientific journal that most widely read is called Scientific American. It's not peer-reviewed. In other words, the editors can say whatever they want. There's no other, other scientists checking what is being said. No, there's peers checking it. And, and their understanding is that the world is so perfect for sustaining life that if you don't want God, and these are the words, if you don't want God, you better have multiple universes. You know, lots of universes with lots of different laws of nature because you can't explain the perfectness of the laws of nature that allow life to be sustained. But that's not the origin of life. No one has any, and we know the forces that are required to sustain life. But to get them, there's about 30 that have to come together like that for life to remain, to sustain. And the likelihood, the secular journal says it explicitly, the only way we can understand getting the laws of nature so perfect is that there must be other universes, not galaxies, other universes with other laws of nature that are not perfect and we're the ones that work. The logic boggles the imagination that it can be put into a scientific journal. There are no data that support of the universes, and our universe is literally designed for life. Now, whether you want to use that design with a capital D or a small d is your own business, but our universe is designed for life. And there are things that are no, there's no way of understanding other way. But on, this, on these three words that are up there, what we can say is we have no idea how it started. Rocks and water had to become alive. The Big Bang didn't produce, the creation of the world didn't produce chilled chopped liver or any chicken soup. It produced energy, light beams. You can be the biggest atheist in the world, the biggest believer in the world, but everyone, everyone in that spectrum understands the fact that light beams became alive. That's a given. The Big Bang produced super powerful light beams, energy in other words. That's what it produced. Einstein showed how energy can change form, the famous equation, what is it, E equals something or other? E equals MC squared, that, that, that energy can change form. And make it clear that it's important to realize that that does not say that the energy changed and became matter. It's very similar to the fact of like this. In this jar is water. When I drink water, You know, you can't beat hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> On a hot day, you want hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> it's great. We just call it water. But it's hydrogen and oxygen. The next time you drink water, remember, you are drinking two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. And when you stick them together, they change form. And that's exactly what E equals MC squared said. I work with a lot of atomic bombs. <laughs> And the first of the bombs I worked with was uranium-235 bomb. It was, it's the kind of stuff that's when I say, like Jerusalem, a few thousand kilometers to the east, but here you say it's around the world, in Iraq and Iran. But when that bomb detonated, it wasn't that the yellow uranium-235 metal suddenly became energy. It was always energy in the form of a metal. Like water is always hydrogen and oxygen, in the form of water. So that E equals MC squared doesn't say that E disappears and becomes M. What Einstein discovered that E, energy, can change form. Now how that happens, no one knows. We do know to like 15 decimal places what you need to make it happen. Stanford, University, my background is MIT, Stanford University, on the other side of you know, the West Coast, was the first university to actually make energy into particles, the lights of the particles, electrons and positrons. So it can change form, but although we know how it works, it doesn't mean we understand, we can use it. It's the same with the iPhones. No one understands how tunneling works. That is how in a particle here is faced by a barrier, which it can't get over and it can't go through. It's an impassable barrier. But guess what? You find it on the other side. If that weren't the case, there'd be no sunlight. And also your transistors wouldn't work either, which would, would be less of a problem, unless they're more important than an iPhone. But it has, so, and there's no understanding of how that happens. But the fact that we know that it does happen, we can use it, we being the scientific community, to build transistors to make you have a smartphone. But it doesn't, doesn't mean that we understand the process. We know how to use it, but the actual process of how E can change into M, 
you know, how it is, because energy has no, you know, it's, it's the stuff coming out of these light bulbs. So there are wonders in this world that are just crucial to me. The world is filled with wonder. The more you know the wonder, the, the deeper your appreciation is for the creation, and hence the, with the big C, creator, which Darwin acknowledges. He gets a bad rap. In the Origin of Species in 1859, the first edition just came out, it was put out very rapidly. Within a few months, there was a second edition. Darwin had to beat a competitor. I mean, in other words, there's a lot of competition that goes into science. But there was another person that was about, Lamarck was about to publish first. They knew each other. So Darwin rushed into print. Within two or three months, the second edition, and all the other editions came out, and which he attributes in the closing chapters of the book to a creator with a capital C, that put these forces into the world that allowed life to develop. Darwin gets a very bad rap because everyone rem remembers what the secular community wants you to remember, namely the first edition of the or the Origin of Species. Those that understand it, 1859. But within, 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 within a very few number of months, way less than a half a year, the second edition came out, and all of the editions have the fact that. Darwin attributes, and he gets one of the few places where he shows anger in his writing, that, he's, that he, it annoys him tremendously that people attribute as if it's all by chance. And he says there were forces by the Creator. It's worth reading those last few paragraphs for so much no one ever gets to. But, but as far as the word, that's exactly the problem here. No one has a clue. But okay. Evolution. The main talk this evening, God willing, is to see how units can be young and old simultaneously. But on evolution, the problem with evolution, if you look at the Genesis chapter 1, it isn't that people are the first or the last. So there's a flow from the simple to the complex constantly. But one thing that's interesting in this, in this slide with all these kinds of life, it does show this famous double helix, right? And an Ammonite at the beginning. All of life, all of life with no exception, has the same genetic code. Whether you're a bacterium, a person, or a pine tree, you have the identical genetic code. It's just that the words on it are written differently. Like you can write a book in English using the English language. You can write one on physics, you can write one on philosophy, you can write one on, on religion, etc., etc. But it's still the same ABC. And it's the same ABC in all of life. And that's amazing because it means that nature, with quotes, got it right the first time around, which is pretty unlikely considering the, the, uh, the nature of nature, the complexity of life itself. But that's the famous discoveries that of a commonality, like the Lord is one hero Israel, the famous statement of Shema Israel, the Lord is one that is a oneness that pervades all of existence. It's the physical level and in the spiritual level. It's a oneness that goes beyond the, that famous Deuteronomy 6.4, which you should understand, part say, but Jesus quotes also. That's the most, it's amazing, you know, you look at these, look at these things that they don't understand their origins even. In any event, it's the most important sentence ever made. And it doesn't just say there's one God, that's clear for them, that there's a oneness, a unity that pervades the world. Physics discoveries in the physical world, and spiritually, that's the key statement of Deuteronomy, that there's this unity. Okay, just a bit more on evolution because we don't really understand it, but there are some things that have happened in the, in the, in, in, in the, in, in the fossil record that, that are unexplainable. Deuteronomy, excuse me, Genesis chapter 1 verse 20, the first mention, the first mention of animals in the Bible goes out on a limb. I mean, I'm deliberately not, I'm not pushing God here, I'm just saying, you make your own decisions, okay? But it goes out on a limb for 3,500 years ago for a text. Tells us that the, that the first expand the life is that the waters teem with teeming living creatures. You should have you should smiled shed it. That the water is filled with life. That's the first sentence about, it's an explosion of life. And suddenly we, we suck it. And we discover, in fact, that there was an explosion of life. It's called the, the Cambrian explosion of life. A half a billion years, and we're going to get into these ages later, so don't, don't, don't turn it off just yet. The uh, half a billion years ago, 
Every phylum that exists today came into being simultaneously. I use Time Magazine because it's graphic, but you can find it in, in peer-reviewed science journals also. The Cambrian Explosion of Life. Even Scientific American brings it down. But what's interesting, the text says it's an explosion of life. It happens in the waters, and it happens on day five. When we get to the age of the universe, we're going to see that this maps directly onto the fifth day. But notice that it's in the waters, and it's an explosion of life. It's an exact match of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 20. Every phylum, now it doesn't mean that there were little people back there. There are 34 or so. A phylum is a class of life. What's our phylum? Chordata. Bilaterally symmetrical, stereoscopic, stereophonic, internal skeleton, complex digestion, separate sexes. That describes us, it describes, it describes lizards, it describes dinosaurs, it describes birds. But it doesn't describe worms. <laughs> They're a different phylum. It doesn't describe crabs. They're a different phylum. So these phylums and every all every body, it's a body plan in other words. Every body plan that exists today came into being simultaneously, and Darwin knew about this, by the way, Darwin knew about it, but Darwin's time, it looked like there was nothing before that. So it didn't make any sense. Well, it still doesn't make sense, but now we see that there are micro, that there are fossils that it takes a magnifying glass to see before this, but they weren't the phyla. These phyla are the beginning right here, and it is called the Cambrian Explosion of Life. I can't quite read what it says. What does it say here? New discoveries show that life as we know it began. The amazing biological frequency and the and the, uh, the other the continuation is on, on the page is does that mean we don't you know has, has evolution changed? It's, no, evolution changed. We just don't understand it. That's what it is. So we don't understand what's going on in the deeper level. But there it is. So, so what are the problems of evolution? Some of the some of the nuances are intriguing. For instance, just like the fourth one down, just to spend a few seconds on this, that's all. The same sex hormone in moths that in, in, in the, well, you see, the sex hormone of moths is the same as the sex hormone of elephants, but they have no they have no common ancestor for half a billion years. Do you realize what turns on a moth is the same thing that turns on an elephant? <laughs> and if you look at the, comp the complexity of this molecule, you can't get it twice by chance. But what it means is that the universe is pre-programmed. Now you can see that in designer or life, but that's the reality. Because there is no connection between moths and, and elephants. It could have said humans also, it's the same for humans, which <laughs> is a little embarrassing, but we all like elephants at times, especially the man. And the, uh, and what, what it's telling us, we see this in many, many other types of, of hormones that they, like they were in there waiting in the wings to be used. There's, there seems to be a pre-programming of the universe for life to develop. Otherwise, you can't explain something like this. Another aspect is the, is the hormone that turns on an eye. It's the same in us as it is in mice, why not, you know, they're both mammals. But it's also the same as fruit flies, which are insects. We have no, no relationship with insects whatsoever. That's what the Cambrian explosion shows. You take, you take the snippet of the DNA that triggers a part of a body to turn on an eye, and it's in, every cell has it, but thank God most people have it turned on right here. So you have eyes in the front of your head. But you can take that hormone like, and, and that snippet of the DNA and put it to the wing of a fruit fly and the fruit fly will develop a fruit fly eye in, on its wing, or any other place that you put in. It's the same. It, it's, these things could not develop twice by chance. It's much too complex. What means is they're there waiting in the wings to be used. And then they become online. Okay, here is something now. Just this, the following, and if I'm going too fast, you'll, you'll let me know. I'm sure. The, uh, the humanity switch. This is talking about the development of the shape of skulls over time. On the far side is a chimp skull, <coughs> here's a human skull, and there's a change that takes place. There are transitional forms but in the fossil record, but it's not every dot is filled in. But it's an interesting article, and this is being published in a journal called The New Scientist. 
which is not peer-reviewed. Watch out when you're getting science from non-peer-reviewed journals. Peer-reviewed me means, just in case somebody doesn't know what it means, like a bank at MIT, and you, you know, publish or perish, so you do an experiment, you write it up, and then you send it off to a good journal, not like, not like the science, new scientists, which is respected, but it's not peer reviewed. So I send it to Nature Journal, one of the major journals in the world. They take my name off it, and they send it to my colleagues, my peers. And then my peers don't know I'm the author, and they'll read it and say it's either good or garbage. If it's garbage, the, the editor writes back, we're not going to publish. If it's good, they publish it. You go home, wife gives you a big hug. <laughs> Maybe you get tender. Okay? So, the, this is not a peer reviewed journal, which means that when you're reading science from non peer reviewed, the editor can spin the information any way he, he or she wants. So that's crucial to remember. But this non peer reviewed journal is quoting peer reviewed scientific publications to bring down the humanity switch. And it's very interesting, just on, as leading into this, but not necessarily related to what I'm about to say is that they call the humanity switch and they relate it to the head. You realize that your entire life takes place between here and here. You have those sensations that don't take place here and here. Everyone, will everyone please move their toes. Now the people in the front row have the problem because I can see your toes. <laughs> but then they can say, they're right, can't see. So, you feel your toes? You feel your toes? Yeah? I can't really see them. You feel them moving in. Oh yeah, I can. Yeah. Do you feel them moving in your shoes? Yeah. yeah. Do you think your toes have a brain? Do you think your toes have any feeling whatsoever? What do you feel your toes? Well, I feel them on the toes, but obviously it's in your head. Exactly. But it's not obvious, but it is true. Your toes, when you move your toes, nerves in the toes are stimulated. They send that information up to your brain, and in your brain you have about six maps of your body. One part of one of those maps is devoted, is, de is devoted to your toes. Those body maps are so powerful on your psyche that they convince you that you're feeling, that, that you're feeling this in your toes almost two meters away. Everything takes place here. There's nothing outside of your head, outside of here, that, that, that that you feel, I feel my fingers moving, no, fingers don't have any brains, it's all here. I feel my ears, no, it's all here. Everything takes place into your head. So the idea of calling this humanity switch is pretty clever because that's where your life takes place. So this is, I think I'll skip this, oh no, I'll skip. this is the article is going to talk about what made these changes. And what it's talking about here is a diagram, this is from the article, you know, if you show the whole page, you see that this diagram is, is a feature of the front page. And it's talking about the fact that about five million years ago, a gene called the SRGAP2A came online. And a common answer has that, it comes online and it's split. One line's going to go off there into a chimpanzees, one towards humans. We wouldn't know this back here if this was all we had, we would just see this change. So first of all, realize you don't have a chimpanzee in your family tree. Although we are genetically, this is not debatable, we are genetically between 98 and 99 percent genetically chimpanzee. That is, there's a common answer, and you don't need genes for that. If you live where I live, you just read the newspapers every day, and you, and you see that we're surrounded by, I won't say it, but sometimes it seems that way. Can anyway. Now what happens then is that gene does something very interesting. It duplicates itself and you get SRGAP2A and SRGAP2B. And that happens and then a third time again. And by the time you have these three lines going up with these three genes operating and you get through people sleeping through lectures. So that, that, is, that is what takes place. It matches the geological record very well. Those are the data that are presented in this article of, of a non peer reviewed journal quoting peer reviewed data three mutations, and you end up with a, a skull. <coughs> These genes determine the shape of the skull. And all the information we have about life is the brain inside a skull matches the shape of the internal of the skull. So once you know the skull shape, you know the brain shape. So here, oh, 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 there it is. There's the, there it is with the, uh, the diagram that you just saw. And here, I think, yeah, here is the summary by the editor. 
I'll read it because a lot of people usually prefer another voice, but I'll do it myself. This is the this is the summary of the article for the average bloke on the street who doesn't have time to read the whole article. So what does he or she do? Because you swap with data. Who has time to read every article? So you read the summary. The essence of humanity largely boils down to a bunch of random mutations, every one of them happening by chance. Really? Is that what the article said? No, the article didn't say that at all. What the article said was the essence of humanity largely boils down to a bunch of mutations. The, in the parent article, the peer-reviewed article, there's not a single word mentioned about random or chance. So why would the article, why would the editor of the New Scientist, that's the name of the journal, want to spin your brain, because that's what it's doing, it's spinning your brain, to tell you that it all happened by chance? There are no data that support it happening by chance. Mutations are not a problem for the Torah. There's an entire section in the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, Vayikra, which talks about mutations. People who are of the priestly class that can't serve in the tabernacle because they've had mutations. They're, it's not that they're, that they're bad people, it's just that, like the orphans had to be perfect, the people doing the orphans had to be perfect. So these imperfect persons still can eat the korbanot, that they're sacrificed but they weren't allowed to serve there. And there's a whole section devoted to that. So the Torah has no problem with mutations. What the Torah has problems with, and what science has problems with, is the word random and chance. There are zero data that shows that mutations are random. And I always say when we have students, I, I, I make it clear, I don't say this in jokes, I say it seriously. If you're an a, taking an a, a advanced placement or something in biology, sciences, or you're in, wherever you are, you never ask the following question before you get your degree. Never ask your instructor, well, show me why they are random, these mutations. Because you probably will not get your degree. I don't think it's a joke. I say it seriously. You can't put a teacher in the corner because the teacher will then say, well, they, they must be random because what else could they be? There are no data that show that they're random. You can't prove that they're God either. We do this, the statistics it looks vastly more like the directive because there's a vast number of wrong decisions and very few right decisions. There's a vast number of wrong mutations and a very few. And if you want to read an article about this from a person who complains it completely secularly, I urge you, Life's Solutions by Conway Morris, the world's leading living paleontologist, published by Oxford University Press, which is completely secular. And he points out, and just to summary, there seems to be no way that nature could have selected the good mutations. Because it's a vast, it's like a forest of mistakes and one little daisy in the middle that works. So that may be part of the pre-programming that we saw, which we know exists, from the sex hormones that we see in the moths, etc., the other animals, or the, the, the iris gene, it's called, which triggers eye going on in fruit flies and also in us as well. So watch out when you get it. When you read the articles, and they are not peer-reviewed, realize that the editor is spinning the information the way the editor wants to spin it. And it may have nothing to do with the reality of the article. It is true, the mutations, no problem. But randomness, chance, don't cut it. This is just has to do with some of the free will that I'm to see Okay. Now, to the age of the universe. <coughs> and one of the big deals is, as Ben pointed out before, should mention, the fact that there is a creation to the universe. If I were back at MIT, let's say 15 years ago, I was, you know, I still, in fact, I wasn't back at MIT 50 years ago. Uh, I've lived in this for 47 years. And I start to teach about the age of the universe. I could get into problems with the federal government of the United States, which have to be in the development years now. Because in the United States, it is forbidden to teach theology in science classrooms in any school that gets public money, public funding, which is almost every school in the universe, and again in, 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 in the United States, except maybe some very small theological colleges. You're forbidden to teach. You're forbidden to teach theology 
in science class. You can teach theology, but it can't be in a sense. Because, see, until 15 years ago, approximately, there was no age to the universe. Most people are not aware of that. But the nice thing about Google, in fact, they brought Jews, is that you, is that you, uh, it's true. I mean, the whole communication is based on you. Waze, WhatsApp, Google, Facebook, I mean, and it goes on and on. The, the, uh, the fact is that the overwhelming understanding of the universe was that it was eternal, the Greek view. But that should sink in, that until, until very recently in scientific terms, maybe after 550 years or 50, 40, 50 years, the scientific opinion of the world was there was no creation. The universe is eternal. The Bible got it wrong from the first sentence. The first, forget the rest of the Bible, they couldn't even get the first sentence right. The universe was eternal. And the two scientists, Arnold Penzies and Robert Wilson at the Bell Labs in the northeast of the U.S., discovered what was called the echo of the Big Bang, and for that they got the Nobel Prize, which is interesting because they didn't know what they discovered. It was the scientists at Princeton that told them what they got, the, they, the Princeton guys didn't hear it didn't share in the, uh, in the Nobel Prize because Penzi and Sir Wilson were the guys that actually found it. They weren't even looking for anything about the creation. They were looking for satellite in, in communications. And there was this noise in the background. And if you have a TV set, actually, what they discovered was the energy left over from the creation. George Gamble had predicted it about almost 80 or 90 years ago that this would be found. And they found it, but they didn't know. They didn't know what they were looking for because they weren't looking for that at all. And hence, they had to be told what they what they discovered. But it's a big deal. See, people say the Big Bang, Roy Vey, is terrible. The Big Bang is the best news for God since Moses came down from Sinai. Besides Chabad, <laughs> <laughs> the Big Bang term does not say what made the Big Bang go bang. The Big Bang is a simple secular way of saying creation. It does not have it within it any term as to what made it happen. The Big Bang allows a secular, if there are any secular people in the world, to talk about a beginning of the world without using the highly loaded term creation, which God forbid a creation sounds like a Olivea creator. So the Big Bang is just a Big Bang. Now, there are data that talk about the development of the universe after, but they never be turned off by the term the Big Bang because it is just another way of saying the creation. You can't quite see the back because there's a diagram in the back that comes from NASA. We'll get to that later. You know, okay, so when we look at the age of the universe, and I wonder if I could skip this, a slide here. Uh, we, ben and I have just been putting these together, so sometimes the, it doesn't, I'm not so sure but, of how everything works together and said, so, but here, here we jump to Adam and Eve. Rosh Hashanah, for the age of the community, of, 